the first above ground Christian church in the world, самая первая христианская церковь в мире, на земле, а не под землей, была здесь. Здесь, наверное, где-то много пчел, потому что яблок не усыпано яблоками. Без пчел здесь, конечно же, не обошлось. Недалеко Бакфаст Эбби, откуда королев Бакфаст вывели. Брат Адам, э, монах из Германии. Всем привет, с вами Дина Блэк Принц, и сегодня мы в Гластенбере аббатстве. Сначала было солнечно, сейчас уже пасмурно, но, надеюсь, будет хороший день. Я вам покажу всю красоту этого аббатства. Сказано, что Гластенбери особенный город здесь. Всяких много легенд, мифов, уникальное место. Пилгримы со всего мира сюда приезжают. Сказано, чтобы основание было в неолитик период 12 тысяч лет назад. Тор, посвященный Архангелу Михаилу, Чалис Хилл. Легенда говорит, что это там было спрятано Холи Грелл, Святой Грааль, дядей Иисуса Джозефом Аримасейским. Король восьмой, Генрих восьмой уничтожил аббатство. Легенды говорят, что король Артур и Дженевер, его жена, были похоронены в аббатстве. И что великий этот, как это называется, блин, кинжал, экскалибрус, может лежать в воде возле Памперлес Бридж. Памперлес мост. Друиды и пеганы говорили, что Гластенбери обладает особенным магнетизмом. И те, которые хотят узнать больше о богине духовно, могут э, как бы ее приня... э, почувствовать на холмах Авалона на холмах Ледиов Авалона и много людей э, нового как бы века и духовные говорят, что Гластенбери это место глубокого целительства Всем привет! Сегодня мы в Гластенбери аббатстве, здесь, где нашли могилу короля Артура и его жены Гвинивер. Гвинивер. Сколько там? 12 фунтов билет стоил, и можно идти в город, туда-сюда ходить, и в аббатство. Тут, по-моему, сколько она сказала? Несколько гектар. Здесь два больших озера. Очень красиво, очень красиво. Сегодня как раз хорошая погода, поэтому я постараюсь вам показать. Ой, видите, девушка одета в такую древнюю одежду. Очень красиво здесь. Вот я только что зашла и прямо, прямо по-другому все чувствуется. Вот зашел шумного города Гластенбери, и здесь такая тишина, такое спокойствие. Еще только 10-17 людей еще мало. И так тихо, спокойно. Пойду посижу где-нибудь на лавочке. Здесь, наверное, где-то много пчел, потому что яблок не усыпано яблоками. Без пчел здесь, конечно же, не обошлось. Очень много яблок везде.
попробовала яблочко. Кисло-сладенько. Но они еще не зрелые, но все равно вкусные. Кисло-сладкое. такое, даже больше сладкого. Вот это кухня Абата. Здесь готовилась еда для дорогих гостей. Кормили их хорошо, чтобы когда они такие расслабленные и понравилось им здесь, что они пожертвовали деньги аббатству. Так что повара были очень здесь хорошие. Короля Артура могилу нашли вот где-то здесь. Мне женщина, вот, которая продавала билеты, сказала. Но сейчас его официальный как бы, этот дом тум, находится вот там. В 11.30 и в 2 часа здесь все проводится экскурсия бесплатно. Так я вот пойду, послушаю, потом вам расскажу. Сейчас в Англии пошел тренд, чтобы всю траву не косить, а только по краям. Но здесь даже больше скошено травы, чем обычно. Обычно делаю дорожку и в центре трава. Но это хорошо для пчел. Ну, здесь как бы цветов нету, но обычно потом цветы через некоторое время. Он, видите, цветы потом появляются. Это очень хорошо для пчел. Водичка для пчел. Точнее, для пчел и для птичек. Гластенбери Эви. Аббатство Гластенбери. Здесь впервые не под землей, а на земле. Христианская чоч в мире. Первая самая в мире христианская чоч. Согласно вот информации, которую я читала. Знаю, что вот это место очень особенное. The first above ground Christian church in the world here in Glaston was before obviously Glastonbury Abbey was built. It was wooden church, first, the first above ground Christian church in the world. Самая первая христианская церковь в мире, на земле, а не под землей, была здесь. Ворота в рай. То есть арки такие же, как у Алска Сидра, чтобы сделать ее сильнее. В 1191 году тела короля Артура и его жены Квенебир сказали, что нашли на южной стороне Леди Чапу 19 апреля 1978 их остатки были перенесены, удалены королем Эдвардом I и королевой Элеонорой к черной мраморной том. Но это здесь том, короче, даже пережила до 1539-го, когда была диссолюшен Хенри VIII. Артур Певненко, вот посвящается тебе это видео. 
где аббатство Гластенбери, где похоронен король Артур. Ну, я надеюсь, что ты будешь жить долго. Но вот здесь вот был похоронен король Артур. И его жена Гуневир. И первая, как я уже сказала, крестьянская церковь в мире наземная была здесь. Какая красивая вот кухня Аббат, Аббата. Какая красота. Какая красота. Site of King Osa's tomb in the year 1191, the bodies of King Osa and his wife were said to have been found on the south side of the Lady Chapel on the 19th April 1278. The remains were removed in the presence of the King Edward I and Queen Eleanor to a black marble tomb on this site. This tomb survived until the dissolution, dissolution of the Abbey in 1539. So the high altar was here. Altar, altar. High altar. Вот алтарь был здесь. Написано high altar. Самый главный алтарь. У них почему-то в Англии главная улица всегда называется High Street, то есть высокая. Парсник пай, пирог из парс, растолнака. That is a flash. Лавровый лист. О, роза. С розой я. Похоже на экшистскую розу, но это, скорее всего, красная с белой. Магазин такой беседочки. Лок кабин. Вот эта женщина в черном собачка. Она сказала, что это был лавочка. Она сделала для своего мужа, потому что он был кремирован. И когда человека кремируют, ничего не остается на земле. И она решила сделать вот эту лавочку ему в честь его памяти. Но ее почему-то оттуда переместили сюда. Она также сказала, что ее сын владеет вот этим отелем вот там, серый такой. Такой большой, кстати, вот сейчас заметил, он большой отель. Я говорю, О, как, как интересно, традиция какая интересная в Англии, когда человек умирает, делает лавочки для него, потому что остается только зала. Ее как бы на ветер пускают, и ничего не остается. Ну, хотя... Лавочку сделают. Это уже хорошая традиция. Особенно в таких местах красивых. Я люблю на природе, когда лавочки сделаны, посвящены кому-то. Но она говорит, он очень любила аббатство. И здесь вот интересная такая надпись. В память моему любимому мужу он был настоящим джентльмен, который останется в сердцах навсегда вечности. Now noticed cosmos flowers. Так еще заметила цветы космоса, они очень хороши для пчел. They are good for bees. Шмель. 
Чего нет, там затаешь шмель. О, маленький большой. Обеплант. Что это у нас тут? Обидиан плант. Послушное растение. Purple sage, фиолетовый sage, black bird. Ну, это красиво. Черная птичка. Не знаю, как по-русски, но очень красиво. Это small scabios, misty butterflies. Пи... Это... Ой, какой красивый всем. 99. Такой, как искусственный. Да, такой смягкий. Solitary B Hotel. 5,99. Ну, нормальная цена такая хорошая. Это красивенький такая плант. 5,99. Может, я куплю. Вот, красиво. Вы прийти, доги? Hello, DJ. Hello. We're joined to the land by a little peninsula. So we're joined to the land to the east. But if you approached from the west, mm -hmm. it would look like an island. Hence the Isle of Avalon, the Isle of Glass, the Isle of Apples. It, it looked like an island. Now the, the old church, the oldest church here, it was, is, is so lost in the mists of time that not even the monks that lived in the medieval abbey knew who built the very first church. So myths have grown up surrounding that. And the myth surrounding the origins of Glastonbury Abbey starts in 64 AD with Joseph of Arimathea. Do we know who Joseph of Arimathea is? Uncle of Jesus. Uncle of Jesus, yeah. He was a trader in base metals. He sailed, so he trading, he had a boat, he was quite rich. Cornwall has legends of him because they've got tin, we've got lead. In the Mendip Hills, we have lead. So Joseph knew these lands, he knew these lands. Now in 64 AD, you can imagine, was he fleeing the persecution of the Christians after the crucifixion of Jesus? Who knows, but it is said, He sailed up to the Bristol Channel and he sailed to the other side of that hill. Can you see the hill with the yes. trees on? Yes. Mm -hmm. The other side of that hill was a deep water port. He moored in that port, he climbed up to the top of that hill with his followers. When he got to the top he said, we are weary all and he stuck his staff into the ground and his followers, they all just sat and, and chilled out. Yeah. That hill is still called Wirriol Hill today. When he woke, he tried to, he tried to get the staff out mm -hmm. of the ground, but he couldn't, it had taken root and it had started to bud. Now Joseph saw this as a message from God, a miracle. The pagans living here at the time, some of them witnessed this and when Joseph, went to the chief and said, please grant me land. I, I, I need to build a church here. The chief said, mm, yes, we, we, we will grant you land because he'd already heard about these miracles. The land he granted Joseph of Arimathea to build the first church was exactly where you see this building now. What you see here is the Lady Chapel. This was built on the very ashes of the original Wattle and Daub church so the original church was made of wood and it is said to have been built by joseph of arimathea's very own hands and, and uh, in it stood a statue of the virgin mary carved from or by joseph of arimathea now this image you know was was carved by somebody that actually knew mary personally oh. so this uh, this image We'll come, I'll talk again about this, the image of Mary. So we have the old church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Early, early sort of, the, the, the saints from Ireland, they came here bringing relics. 
this became a place of pilgrimage, of healing. Um, we get the Anglo-Saxons coming, you know, in the 6th, 7th century. They want to make their mark here too. So they build a further three churches where the people are stood there. Um, that's where they built the wooden churches in the Anglo-Saxon period. And what they did to the old church is they covered it with a lead roof and they protected it with a wall. It was ancient. Um, we do know that there's charters from the seventh century mentioning this old church. Um, by the time we get to the 10th century, um, after the Viking raids, we have, does anyone know Dunstan? Heard of Dunstan? St. Dunstan? No? Yeah. Yeah. St. Dunstan. Well, St. Dunstan was born and bred not far from here and he was an abbot here. And when he came in the 10th century, he was shocked because the monks were married. They had children. And he was... So St. Dunstan headed a, a, a massive monastic reform in the 10th century here. And it was basically him that really sort of drove Glastonbury Abbey forward, making it a powerhouse of worship and education. He was the one that created the library and the scriptorium, and it was one of the wealthiest abbeys in the land. And then we get to the 11, 1184, there is a huge fire, and most of what was here is burnt down. The old church was burnt down. Um, the one thing that survived is the statue of Mary. Um, everything else got burnt down, but Mary, the only, the only thing that you could see is that she blistered, as if she was crying. That was the, one of the first miracles that happened at Glastonbury Abbey, is the statue of Mary withstood the fire. Within two years, they had rebuilt what you see now on top of the ashes of the old church and in it stood the miraculous image of, of yeah. Mary. We're going to head down and I'll talk to you about the Lady Chapel now. Are you okay? If you want to ask any questions at any time, do. So this would be a place of, of pilgrimage. Uh, people came on pilgrimage for healing, mainly for healing. Um, most pilgrims probably would not have been able to read and write. So how stories were sort of got across to them was through sculptures and paintings. This archway is actually telling you a story. And I'm going to use this modern laser thing to point out a few things. This is telling the story of the Annunciation to Mary and the massacre of the innocents. So here we have the angel Gabriel and he's informing Mary that she's going to give birth to the Son of God. But look, it looks like they've upgraded her to a four-poster bed rather than a stable, you know? Um, here we have the angel Gabriel again. These were the shepherds. They're very, very worn now. The shepherds that were tending their flocks by night. And we have the wise men, the kings. They, there they are. They're off following the star of Bethlehem. On the way, one of them is visited in a dream by the angel Gabriel. An angel tells them, tells him, tell Joseph and Mary not to go back to the Holy Land because, because we have King Herod. Now King Herod sees Jesus as a threat to his kingship. So he orders his soldiers to kill the firstborn male of every family. And this soldier has a baby on the end of his sword. Yeah. And there we have the weeping mothers and the empty baby cradles, the horrific story. These, in between the arches, are fantastical beasts. This one has a human in his mouth. This is telling them what happens if you don't repent your sins and believe in God. You'll go to hell and be eaten by a beast. <laughs> Let's come into the Lady Chapel. Oh, that's pretty. I think. So, if you follow the little torch here, um, you can see the traces of paint 
-hmm. and patterns and things. You can also see it over this side, all the way along underneath the arches there. Mm -hmm. So when, when the archaeologists did conservation work here, they have discovered pigments and patterns and they've been able to recreate what it looked like here. So as you pass by this board, you glance at this, and this is, this is how they think it would have looked like. And these were rich, bold colours. This blue comes from Afghanistan, very rich and expensive. And if you imagine you're a pilgrim coming from a sort of a wattle and door village, yeah. coming in here would have been absolutely um, just mind-blowing. Yeah. Originally, the Lady Chapel uh, finished at this archway here. It stood alone, um, and they rebuilt it within two years. And it stood on the ashes of the very old church. If you go through the archway there, and you go down the stairs, you will pass by a well. That well predates anything here. It's the oldest thing here. It's likely to be the reason why the original church was put here in the first place. It may have been a pagan sacred well, which is a lot of the time, a lot of Christian yeah. uh, sites were, were sort of put next to pagan. What you see under here, you're actually stood on the original floor level of the Lady Chapel. But what you see here, this is a crypt dedicated to Joseph of Arimathea. This was dug out 300 years after they built the Lady Chapel. That is an engineering feat yes. for the medieval period, yes. for them to have dug yes. that out with, 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 with this still standing uh -huh. is, is quite remarkable. Um, it is said that um, when they did dig it out, they found some very, very early Christian burials, one which is supposedly been of Joseph of Arimathea. If you go down and sit near the altar and look up at the ceiling, where it crosses at the top, you'll <coughs> notice a lot of holes. What they were for is, as a pilgrim coming in for healing, you would have stayed in the high street. You would have stayed in the inn. Yeah. In the morning, you would have come into the abbey. You would have passed by a little market stall where you would have been able to buy a votive offering. For example, if you've got a bad leg, you would have been able to buy a wax image of a leg. And they came into the abbey, the monks would give them their bread and water, and they would give the votive offering to the monk, and the monk would hang it above the high altar. So all of the holes had lots of like votive offerings just hanging there. As the altar candles burnt, the wax melted, and you would be healed. And that was the whole process of, of the healing yeah. um, uh, over the altar. Otherwise, they would be coming to see um, the shrines of saints. So I'm going to go back to the fire that destroyed the original church. And they built this within two years. It was Henry II that gave them the money to rebuild this lady chapel. And in 1191, he died, and they had not enough money to rebuild the rest of the abbey. Uh, so what were they to do? You know, what were they to do? Well, actually, before Henry II died, he told the abbot that he'd been told by a Welsh bard that somebody important was buried in the graveyard in Glastonbury Abbey. Someone that could change the fortunes of Glastonbury Abbey. And we're going to head out there now, and our moment where the monks run out of money, it's unfinished. Yes. Unfinished. Yes. The unfinished archway. We think it was going to be Adam and Eve, because there's a tree and we think it's Adam. Yeah. Why they never finished it after they built, we will never know. It's, it's a mystery. There's a lot of mysteries associated with Glastonbury Abbey. Another important stone is this one. Jesus. Um, this is uh, what they Maria. call the pilgrim stone. And it's, it's where the pilgrims would touch. Um, it's Jesus and Maria, Mary, you know. Um, very, very important stone. We're just going to walk over here now. Yeah, come on, okay. Come on. You guys. This graveyard was in use 
since the first century with the very, very first church. Uh, monks, abbots, people of well-to-do uh, were buried here. And it is said in 1191, um, the monks dug here. There was two columns, stone columns with, with, with symbols around them. And the abbot was thinking, that's where someone important is buried. So he s instructed the monks to, to dig, to dig down. And they dug extremely deep and they uncovered an oak coffin with two skeletons, a large male skeleton with a split through his skull. A, a, a female skeleton with a little bit of blonde hair. And when the monks touched the blonde hair, it turned to dust. On the chest of the male skeleton was a lead cross with the words engraved, here lies King Arthur and his wife Guinevere, buried on the Isle of Avalon. Wow. The monks had found the burial place of the legendary mythological king of Britain, the best king in the whole of Britain. Yeah. Um, people flocked here. People flocked. Lords and ladies, they came to pay homage to this, to this amazing discovery. And with all of these people came money. Yeah. And they were able to finish off what had been burnt down. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, that was a really good PR <laughs> stunt, you know. And it worked, it did, you know. But let's go back to the 6th century in Somerset. Has anyone heard of Cabra Castle? There's a hill fort not far from here. Those banks and ditches were re-dug during the 6th century. Excavations have revealed that it was a high status political uh, chieftain's home. So, if there was such a person as, as Arthur, and Camelot was Cabri Castle, and he was killed by an Anglo-Saxon sword, this is where he would have been buried, because this is the most oldest graveyard standing in the shadow of the origins of Christianity in all of the lands. <coughs> so we leave it up to you. Is it a myth, or was there truth to it? We're going to go and see what they did now with the building of the abbey. Hello. Finished the Lady Chapel and then they started to build the main part of the abbey. What you see here, this, this little bit here, this is called the Galilee. This was added in the 14th century. And what this did, they knocked the eastern wall of the Lady Chapel down and they built the Galilee. And what this did is it opened the whole thing up making it the longest, the longest abbey, even bigger than Westminster in the early medieval period, 177 metres long. And we're going to go and stand in the middle of the nave now, and I'm going to try and give you an idea on how massive it would have been. The Lady Chapel, and then swing it right up there. Wow. Can you just, wow. how huge wow. this would have been. Those transepts there, imagine them a third higher. And they were holding up a huge scissor arch. Wow. These uh, squares, they were the pillars that was holding up this huge vaulted roof. Um, if we look at the arches in the Lady Chapel, that is Romanesque architecture. If we swivel here, that's Gothic. Yeah. Gothic architecture with a little bit of uh, Eastern influence with the, with the chevrons. Two, different types of architecture going on here. So the pilgrims, they would enter through the gateway in the, in the wall over there and they would walk through the north porch and they would come into this space and they would be filled with awe. Painted walls, stained glass windows, golden candlesticks. There were shrines to saints everywhere. Beautiful stone carved bishop, effigies of bishops, beautifully tiled floor. They would have looked up to the high altar. They weren't allowed up there. Pilgrims had to stay here. They were not allowed past the transepts there. But they would have looked up there and they would have seen the abbot in all of his finery. They would have seen the monks with their hoods up and their hands together. They would have heard the Gregorian chant and they would have been smelling the incense 
every one of their senses bar taste would have been heightened which was the whole purpose this was the house of god and it served its purpose we're going to head up to the high altar now and we always got to trace of the worship of god went on um, it took two years to build the lady chapel it took 150 to build the rest of it they could only go six layers at a time because medieval mortar or cement took so long to dry they could only do it in layers of, of six the thing is, is, is you, you mustn't think that Glastonbury Abbey was built and that was it we've had 52 abbots here most of them not all but most of them changed something rebuilt cloisters added a crypt the bit right at the end there that was only built 30 years before the disillusion it was an ever-changing place it wasn't just built obviously the nave and this part was pretty much unchanged but lots of little crypts and, and chapels were added uh, ever ever changing in 1278 probably in celebration and Eleanor of Castile reburied Arthur and Guinevere right bang in front of the high altar now if you were here on the 19th of April in 1278 did anyone see uh, the coronation of Charles or Queen yeah. burial yeah. Yeah. that's what it would have been like here yeah. it would have been you wouldn't have been able to squash yourself into the nave. I would have made so much money selling my potions at the gates. You know, it was a really, really important day. Um, they buried Arthur and Guinevere here with their kneecaps out. Apparently their kneecaps were out because pilgrims and, and you need, they like to see the bones and touch them. Oh. Not that any of the pilgrims would have come up to this area. Yeah. But by this time, um, Glastonbury Abbey was the most richest and influential of, of abbeys. In fact, the abbot of Glastonbury was only sort of, he was only second richest to the king. Um, they owned a lot of lands. Their library here, oh my goodness, William of Malmesbury, who wrote The Kings of Britain, he researched, he researched his book in Glastonbury Abbey. Um, the scriptorium was oh, amazing, amazing, but the library was not open to everybody. It was a sort of a protected, knowledge was protected. And when William of Malmesbury came here, he had to have a letter written from the king to get, gain access to the library. So anyway, we get to King Henry VIII, and he wants to marry Anne Boleyn. And uh, so he asks the Pope, and the Pope says no. So Henry VIII, what does he do? He decides to break from Rome and become head of his own church, the Church of England. And in doing so, within four years, Henry's men had closed down between eight and 900 religious houses. Glastonbury was one of the last seven to be closed down. The abbot at the time, was Richard Whiting. He's an old boy. He was in his 80s. He was well loved by all the monks. And when Henry's men rode through the gate, Richard Whiting stood and blocked their way. He refused to give the keys of the abbey over to Henry's men. So what did Henry's men do? Well, they falsified charges of theft and treason against him, found him guilty, and they tied him onto a hurdle dragged him up to the tour and hung Jew and courted him. His head went on the gate, part of his body went to Bath, part to Somerton and part to Ilchester. He was made a martyr because of that. He is a martyr. After that, Henry VIII gave the ruins to the Duke of Somerset and it became his private garden. And what he did, basically they stripped the lead all of the wealth, the gold, the stained glass windows, the marble, everything, all got stripped away, just leaving the stone, which over the next sort of, up until the early 20th century, was pilfered away, quarried away. Um, people will say, what happened to the bones then? Because actually we had a king, we had three Anglo-Saxon kings buried here, 
Edmund I was over there, Edmund II, Arthur, and King Egbert was up there. When the archaeologists did a dig here in the 20th century, they discovered a pit over there with 19 skeletons in it. Did the monks move, Arthur and Guinevere? Or is that, who knows, it's another mystery. There's a lot of mysteries sort of associated with it. But this, this, the stones from the, 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 the ruin were used to build the road from Glastonbury to Wells. And actually, there is a really good fish and chip shop across the road. <laughs> it's been frying fish for 100 years. But if you go and sit in the restaurant, you will be sat around the Abbey Stone. The actual building was built in the 16th century from the Abbey Stone. It was just reused, reused. In the early 20th century, the private owners were the Austins, and they lived in that house at the top there. And they decided to emigrate to New Zealand, and so what they did was they auctioned the ruins. And on the day of the auction, there was an agent for the Catholic Church, and there was an agent for the Church of England, and the agent for the Catholic Church missed the train. <laughs> so blow me down, it was the Church of England that bought the ruins. But what they decided to do was they decided to make it safe and open it up to the public. So if you look around and look at these walls, you'll see a date, 1909, 1909. As you wander around, you may notice sort of some modern dates. If you make safe an ancient monument, you must put the date so it distinguishes it from the original stone. So that is why you'll see that. So we're going to go over to where the monks live now. Is everyone okay for time? Mm-hmm. Cool. My name's, I'm Matilda. My character is Matilda. Oh, nice. <laughs> so here, um, at the time of the dissolution, and basically most of them were paid off. It was like if you took, you know, took the money and ran, you know, they, they, they didn't stand behind the abbot when he was denying Henry's men entry. Um, and this is where they live. It was a closed community, a Benedictine community. And we're going to go down into where the monks live. But first of all, have a look at the little archway at the top there. So in your mind, in your mind, imagine a corridor leading from that archway that goes right across over to the dormitory. That was their night corridor. So at night time, the monks would, would come out of their little dormitory and they'd shuffle along the corridor and come down into the into the high altar area to say their prayers in the daytime they would line up in the cloisters uh, and wait for the the doors to be opened corner of the cloisters now the cloisters is just basically a sort of a very ornate covered corridor um, and it would have been open you know here this today is a wild garden but in the medieval period, it would have been a garden of meditation. And basically the cloisters was where the, the monks would come and chill out. They'd come and sit and they'd read, they'd have a little chat, they'd sort of roam around. It was also used in the form of punishment. In the 14th century, the Archbishop of Canterbury had to come here to investigate crimes. And the crimes were basically what happened is two of the monks were expelled uh, another three monks were restricted to the cloisters for a year, so they weren't allowed beyond. So it was used as a sort of form of, not a bad punishment, really. The crime, sins of the flesh and too much partying. But anyway, so the cloisters also is, if you, if you imagine a wheel, you've got the centre of the wheel and spokes coming off of it. The cloisters is where everything you get the, the entrance to everything else. So you've got the entrance to the abbey, the entrance to the abbot's place. Over there, that is the step that goes up to the chapter house. The chapter house behind you was kind of like the headmaster's office. That was the abbot's office. The little wall that you see there, was the day room downstairs and the dormitory at the top, which is where, if you imagine, you know, the, door, the corridor going right across there. Um, the rough area over there where you can just see a little bit of underground water into it, which basically washed all the waste away 
into the gardens over there. It was a communal toilet, so it was a wooden seat and they could sit there chatting with their friends and all sorts. Um, when the archaeologist did a dig here, they found the remains of musical instruments over there. The remains of a jaw harp and a flute. Where they sat on the playing music, did it just fall out of their pockets? Who knows, but you can see those in the museum if you look carefully. Here we have, this is the cellar beneath their dining room. Monks, they had to eat basically a vegetarian diet. They were allowed sort of fish, cheese, eggs. Um, they, they were allowed maybe chicken on feast days, but basically they had a pretty plain diet. We know that they had pea soup on Mondays. And I also know that they tried to reclassify a beaver as a fish so they could eat it, but it didn't quite work out. It didn't quite work out. They would have to sit here in silence, eating whilst being read the scriptures. And if any of them fell asleep, they would have to forego their food and they would have to get up and read the scriptures. Now the food that they were eating here was very, very different to what was going on down in the Abbots complex. And that's where we're gonna head now. But first of all, we have a look at this wall here. Can you see the, the two rows of squares? That's obviously where the, the, the roof of the cloisters was, but you'll notice some other marks. Oliver Cromwell camped here with his army and they used that as, as target practice. So those scars are musket ball scars. Let's head down to where complex. Um, the abbot generally was quite well to do. Normally, you know, he would have been related to the king or the queen. Um, very, very influential. Uh, the abbot of Glastonbury sat in the House of Lords. He had the ear of the king. Um, and it is said that if, if the abbot of Glastonbury wed um, the, the, the top nun at Shaftesbury, they would be even richer than the king. Very, very wealthy abbot. He even had his own army, which was stationed over there. And we have read that there were a lot of skirmishes between the Bishop of Wells and the Abbot of Glastonbury over territory. Yeah, you'd think of them as being peace-loving folk, but no, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. Lots of skirmishes over territory. So if you were a person of great standing, for example, when Edward and Eleanor came to rebury Arthur and Guinevere, they stayed here for five days. They wouldn't have stayed in the inn in the high street. They would have stayed over there where that little bit of slither of stone is. That was where the abbot had his huge manor house. Some people called it the palace. Very, very high status. Um, this that you see the outline here, this was the abbot's great hall. This seated 500 people. 19 kings have visited Glastonbury Abbey. Not all of them stayed overnight but all of them would have eaten in this great hall. And it's a bit like now when you've got like a executive director of a company and you wine and dine your clients, don't you? Very much the same. The abbot was whining and dining, you know, hoping for sort of some money and, and, and the lords and the ladies wanted their candles to be lit for them for the rest of their days and prayers to be said. It was a really good system. Um, we're gonna end, we're gonna go into the abbot's kitchen and talk about what food was being eaten in here. But first of all, you see the little tree there? That is an English thorn. Can you see the little one behind? That is a Middle Eastern thorn tree. That is a descendant of the original holy thorn that grew on Wirial Hill, the one from Joseph. And you can tell the difference between the trunks um, and we have um, Kew Garden holds, they, they graft it. So when we need a baby one, we just ask Kew Garden and we get a baby one. So it's not the original, but it is a descendant of the original Holy Thorn. Let's head off into the... Go in the archway and go up some steps. It's a really good place to get a photograph or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. 
You're a very pretty doggy. <laughs> Are you very pretty doggy? Yes, you're very nice. Very well behaved. So welcome to the Abbot's kitchen. This is not the original kitchen. Um, when the archaeologists did excavation here, they discovered an earlier floor. This was built in the early 14th century, and this was the latest design in air conditioning. So if you look up at the roof, this is what we call a mountain roof, and it's designed to take the heat up the middle, and they can control the shutters around the outside so that there is airflow. This is the best preserved building of its kind. In fact, there's only two like this. This one and one in Clooney Abbey. Which um, Abbey? It's Clooney Abbey. Ah, so it's a really important bearer of their sort of building. Now, if you notice, we've got four fireplaces. It would have been incredibly hot in here, incredibly hot. They would have needed, you know, some form of, of air conditioning. We do know that the kitchen was divided into two. This was the wet side, and that was the dry side. This corner, hot wash, that's where they did all the hot washing. And this one, anything to do with boiling of water, potage, casseroles. You see the saw-like things, that's temperature control. We just turn our dial on that. They would have had to have been whiffing it up and down. Over there, the spit roast. And as you can see, they did eat four-legged beasts in here. They would have had boar, venison, the most luxurious red meat going. This oven was the patisserie oven. They loved their pies and tarts. Bread and beer was not made in here. Bread and beer was made elsewhere. The food that was prepared in here was the best of the best. And it was for to be eaten by the nobles in the great hall. They would have been using expensive spices the best of everything. One of their one of their meals, one of their feasts, cost three and a half thousand pounds in their day. Who can, who can turn that into modern thousands and thousands of pounds for a five-day feast? You know? This platform here, that was a wooden platform. That's where the head chef and his apprentice would have stood. So you can imagine a bit like Gordon Ramsay and Gino up there, can't you? He would have had to have been elevated because this was a busy kitchen using expensive ingredients. He would have needed to be up there to see what was going on and to bark out orders. The other thing I've just recently discovered is I was sort of monks in the cooking. No, no. The monks held the keys to the cellars and they were the ones that were bringing in the ingredients but it was lay people that were doing the cooking. Um, and it was a hereditary job that was passed down through generations. The same as the bakery and the laundry. And also, male only. No women allowed in here. Just males in here. And the family that passed this job down through their generations were actually called the cooks. So we think, why is this building still stood when there's not a lot else? We think possibly because of the shape of it. If you start taking bricks away, the whole lot is just going to fall down upon you. You know, so I mean, we're very frank that this is standing. Um, but you know, the, the question as to why is who knows, but we think it might just be because of the shape of it. So after the dissolution, the Duke of Somerset moved in some Flemish weavers. They were the ones that made that fireplace smaller. So if you look at it, you can see originally it was a lot bigger. So they made the fireplace smaller. They also, if you look at those holes there, they put a platform. So they slept up there and they worked down here because they were the best weavers and we had to leave the wall. After them, uh, it became a Quaker prayer house and what you're sat on there is from the Quaker period. And then it fell into disuse and it was a cow shed. And, um, if you have a look at the walls, you'll notice there's a lot of graffiti. So it's during this time, possibly, that you have travellers travelling through, and they must have camped in here, and they must have drunk some Somerset cider, and then they must have decided to do <coughs> all over the walls. So if you get up close and personal, you will come across 
some dates and names which are very, very interesting. The other thing is there are 11 stonemason marks in here. And again, children, if you want to be adventurous, you might be able to find some. There's an axe around that here. There's very, very unusual marks here. There's another one above the fireplace over there. And there's also a symbol here, which is very interesting. It's, um, it's two, two, two W's together. That apparently is a symbol for the Roman cult of Mary. Uh, very, very interesting. Any questions before I put this copy into the world of the Benedictine? The friars and that sort of thing, they didn't do so much of that. Um, and they were more out there in the public. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a very closed off. Very close off community. The, the monks who lived here in the medieval period, no one knew who built the original church here. Mm -hmm. there's, there's mention of it in the Anglo Saxon charters. There was a wooden church here. Nobody knows mm -hmm. who built it. So the myths of Joseph of Arathia have, have kind of grown surrounding it. There's, that's one myth. The other myth is that missionaries came over in the 7th century and built it. But whatever they call it, it's the earliest Christian in the whole of Britain at the time. Um, in fact, Elizabeth the first used used um, used the fact that Joseph of Arimathea came here um, to, to sort of validate the Protestant religion to break it away. Well, why shouldn't we have our own church? Joseph himself came here and built a church. You know, it was sort of um, it was used to sort of так регулировали температуру выше, ниже. Через вот эти вот здесь она еще что-то было подвязывали так вот чем-то. Короче, второе такое здание в мире. Еще одно аббатство Клуни во Франции. И здесь. Но камни говорят не украли, потому что строение такое было что если украдешь там несколько камней, оно может все рухнуть. Поэтому вот это здание сохранилось целиком. Потому что трудно было украсть камни. Интересная идея. Вот, строите особенной архитектуры, и тогда оно сохранится. Вот так. Интересно как. Четыре угла таких. И крыша круглая. Удуги, you beautiful, don't be shy. Very beautiful. Потратили на еду королю 350 тысяч фунтов на сегодняшний день. Я рада, что людям разрешают собаками войти в музей. Вот, много собак сегодня здесь. Очень радостно видеть собачек. Недалеко Бакфаст Эбби, откуда королев Бакфаст вывели. Брат Адам, э, монах из Германии. The well. Спасибо всем за просмотр. Я надеюсь, вам понравилось это аббатство в Бластенбери. Если вы когда-нибудь в этих краях, обязательно посетите. Очень-очень красиво. Вообще город такой интересный, очень такой духовный. И, конечно же, Гластенбери Тор. Всем спасибо за просмотр. Ставьте лайки, комментируйте. С вами была Дина, Блэк Принц. Хорошего дня!